Let's get started in the, what's the fifth lesson. My goal is to do eight of these, uh, which means that um, tonight's five, then sixth and seven, then we'll have a few weeks off and then we'll try to close this out in November. Now, I am not making any promises on that eight lesson uh, goal, but I'm kind of looking ahead thinking that that's doable. Um, I didn't come into Ruth with an idea at all about how long it would take. I knew it would take longer than four weeks. There's four chapters and we're not going to be able to go that fast. So I'm shooting for eight. We might be a little closer to 10. In, but in any case, I want, to, I want to start tonight with our title, which is when you are the answer. Um, and what I mean by this will become clear, of course, as we teach, but I'll say up front that I don't mean the answer for your own salvation or your own righteousness. You're never the answer for your own salvation. I know we shouldn't have to go through this, but I do go through this. I just make sure to say this again. You are not the answer to getting your, yourself to heaven or you're not the answer for saving your own soul. This is not a self-help lesson when you're the answer to your problem. Um, this is more about you being the answer to whatever it is you're praying about because whatever it is, I can promise you you're going to be involved. And so this is not a prayer lesson, but we can't do this lesson without talking about prayer. And that's because that's our communicative device between us and the Father is that we pray. So when we look at biblical stories that are allegorical for our relationship, and I think it's pretty obvious that Ruth is at least in some part an allegory of our relationship. All of us who come into the family of God come in through a Redeemer. Our Redeemer's name is Jesus. Ruth's Redeemer's name is Boaz. So we become the, the Ruth character at some point in this story, at least for a little bit. And since we're looking at an allegorical story of her redemption, then our redemption comes into play. Well, we don't get to walk up and shake the hand of Boaz, Jesus, but we do have a relationship with him and we encounter that relationship through prayer. So prayer is going to be a part of this journey. I thought it would be good before we read any text tonight to tell the story to this point, And I don't mean to belabor it, but just to remind you of what this story is. And I also realized that I haven't actually told the whole story. We, it, so it kind of feels like you have a Bible of your own. So you've probably read the four chapters of Ruth. So you know how it ends. Um, at the same time, I'm also acutely aware that reading the Bible is not um, a practice for every believer. Um, I know it is for you, but it's not for everyone. And even when they read it, they don't understand it. And I'm not mocking. Uh, believe me, I'm not cutting that down. They read it, but they don't know what they just read. They read a story, but they don't, doesn't really soak into the soil of their heart. Well, that's what teaching's for. So for those that know this part of the story, forgive me or fast forward two minutes and uh, you, you can skip this. The book of Ruth is a story of a woman named Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons, Melon and Chilion, who live in the land of Judah. They travel out of Bethlehem and they travel into the land of Moab. Moab lies just to the east of the Dead Sea in modern day Jordan. They travel across, the, probably around the southern horn of the Dead Sea, into the land of Moab, the sworn enemies of God and God's people. The Torah that uh, recounts the history of the law has Moabites in it, and they're not welcome. And they are not to be part of the assembly of God and of the people of God. And that's the scenario into which Elimelech and Naomi walk their two children into. And they stay there 10 years. And in that 10 years, Malon and Chilion marry two Moabitess girls, one named Ruth and one named Orpah. And while they are there, Malon and Chilion, whose names mean sickness and destruction, die. And then, rumor has it, there's bread back home. So Naomi decides to go back to the only place she's ever really known. She heads back to Judah. And her two daughters-in-law go with her, even though on the way there, she warns them that this is not your home and this is not your place and I don't have anything to offer you and I don't have any money for you and I'm too old to have kids so that you can marry them. And if I did actually have them, it'd take years for them to be old enough to marry you. So we don't have enough time in our lives for me to be of any benefit to you. So I encourage you two girls to go home. One of the girls, Orpa, does go home. She turns her back and walks away. Her name means nape of the neck because the last thing we see of Orpah is the back of her neck walking away. The one girl decides to stay and affords us with probably the Old Testament's greatest piece of poetry outside of the book of Psalms, 
Wherever thou goest, I will go. Wherever thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Wherever thou diest and are buried, that's where I will die and be buried. Uh, so much more do unto me death, and so much more, if anything but death, depart part me from thee, she says to Naomi. Naomi says, okay, come back. Can't make any promises, but let's go. And they go back into the land of Judah. And upon arrival in Judah, Ruth goes to work. She sort of cashes in on what is the hospitality of the children of Israel, because the children of Israel believe that if a stranger enters your land, they are to be afforded the opportunity to glean the fields. And to glean is to pick up whatever's left over. And so Israel was not allowed to harvest the edges of their fields. Those edges belong to the poor and the stranger. Uh, Israel was not allowed to pick up every single grain off of every stalk. They were supposed to leave those so that people could come behind them that didn't own a field and they could glean. This was not considered charity so much in, as in a handout, but it was considered an opportunity. Ruth still had to go out into the field. She still had to glean, and she does. And she lights upon a field, to use good old King James Version. She lights upon a field owned by a very wealthy man named Boaz. And as we found last week, Boaz is so smitten with Ruth that he tells his workers, um, I want you to drop some handfuls on purpose when you go back out to work this afternoon. In other words, as you're gathering up your grain and you're tying it up, I want you to miss the bag. When you're supposed to be putting it into the bag for harvest, I just want you to miss and just drop it on the ground. Drop some handfuls on purpose so that this young lady can come behind you and get more than should ever be allowed. And that's exactly what happens. And that led us to a lesson last week on the goodness of God and the favor of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God. And I got a lot of response this week from people watching who that was the lesson. That was the lesson that this thing has been leading up to for them. This idea that God cares for you so much that he is walking your fields and he is dropping handfuls on purpose for you. That things that you don't deserve, things that you cannot earn, things that you cannot possibly ever pay him back for, he doesn't expect to be paid back. Uh, and I hope you spent a little time this week soaking in that word and thinking about a couple of moments in your life that maybe are handfuls on purpose that you didn't, you weren't that smart. You weren't that good. You weren't that timely. Maybe God is just that good to you. Maybe grace is just that big. And if you can spot those moments, they're good moments of praise. They're good moments of thanksgiving. And I encourage your prayer time to be some times of reflection, to try to find where's God giving me handfuls on purpose. And in learning where God is giving me handfuls on purpose, how might I give somebody else a handful on purpose? Like, where could I be more gracious? That's not condemning. That's, the, that's a challenge we all need to pick up. Where could I today be more gracious in the way I speak to someone, in what I give to someone, in the opportunity I afford someone? Um, don't look at it as a handout. Look at it as a hand up if you need to. Look at it as something that you can do to miss the bag in one way or the other. And that, that doesn't, we don't need to categorize that in one way. That can be a lot of ways, however way the Lord shows you, however way he speaks to you. Um, I do want to drop in one verse right here as we get started, a verse that we read to you a week or so ago. I don't remember what the, the weeks kind of come together. But this is a statement from Boaz to Ruth that I want you to log away tonight because it's going to be a verse off of which we build our thought. This is from Ruth chapter 2, verse 18, or verse 12, sorry. The Lord repay your work. This is Boaz talking to Ruth. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. And so, simply put, I know there's not a, a big reason for this verse right here yet, but you will see why in a moment. But in simple terms, Boaz says, essentially, um, God's going to bless you. You've come to God to take care of you. I'm praying that God put you under his wing and he protects you. It sound, it's a little bit like me saying, boy, Brian, God has really got you this week. God's going to do something in your life. It's a good statement. It's, uh, it's, it's worthy of, I, I would amen it. I mean, if somebody said to me, you know, hey, you're under God's shadow this week and he's going to bless you, I'd say, amen, bring it on. Sounds good to me. There's not a lot of responsibility in this verse. It's just a prayer. You know, you just throw it out there. We do it all the time. We say, I'll be praying for you. And the responsibility to do that is then up to us, whether we do that or not. That's between you and the Lord. 
Um, but there, there, that's it. That's just, that's just a statement. I want it to just hang out there for a little while. I want you to keep it in mind. And let's pick up the reading from about where we were last week in verse 18. She took up the grain. Remember, this is after the day is over. She goes into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she kept back after she'd been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? Where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. This is an interesting verse, uh, statement by Naomi, I think, at the beginning of verse 20. The Lord hasn't forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. Why should you throw the dead in? If you're reading this for the first time, you go, like, the Lord hasn't forsaken the living and the dead. Remember, Naomi has lost her breadwinners. She lost her husband. She lost her sons. And for all intents and purposes, she's been cut off from the family inheritance. There's really nothing for Naomi. When she comes back to Judah, she's only coming back because it's home and there's bread. And she literally has nothing in Moab. She lost her husband and her sons, and they're not even her people. And she returns home. Now she's dragging along a daughter-in-law. She tried to talk into staying home. And she's supposed to help take care of this girl. So she sends the girl out to glean, which is what we poor people do. This is what Naomi's got to be thinking. And it's just a little sad for Naomi because when I left, I had a husband and I had two kids. And a husband and two kids means I have a future. I have an inheritance. I have a husband who's going to take care of me. And if he dies, I got boys that are going to take care of me because that's the culture I live in. Now I don't have any of that. And now I'm at the bottom end of the social rung. I'm out here gleaning. I'm not harvesting my own field. We don't have fields anymore. Because I don't have a husband. I don't have a bloodline. I've been cut off from all of that. So I'm out here now sending this Moabitess girl out here to glean whatever we can find on the ground. And lo and behold, she comes back and landed in the field of Boaz. The Lord still cares for the dead. What's she mean by that? The Lord remembers I've lost my support system. My husband and son's have been cut off. But death doesn't stop my God. Paul will recycle this in a way, and I'm not assuming Paul means to recycle it, but he does in Romans 8 when he says, neither height nor depth, nor things present nor things to come, nor life nor death shall separate us from the love of God. Not even death can cut me off from the love of God. So whatever Paul meant by that, Paul meant by that. But what Naomi seems to mean by that is God hasn't forgotten that I don't have anybody. So he sent you to Boaz, which is great because Boaz is actually a relation of ours. And I think he's an upright guy and I think he'll do the right thing. And if he does the right thing, we got a shot now. And I don't mean we've got a shot that you have a place to go reap or glean tomorrow. I mean, we got a shot. There's a chance that we could get back in the inheritance because you picked the right field. Now, don't go anywhere else. Stay there. Stay in his field. That's what she tells her daughter-in-law. And don't pick anyone else's spot to go to. Stay right there. This is, and that 20th verse says, he's our close relative. Let me talk about that phrase for just a second. It's the Hebrew word goalenu, which is translated redeemer, essentially, because it's a legal familial function. So it's not... It's not the New Testament word of buying out of the slave market. But it's the Old Testament word of a legal purchase. For instance, if a childless woman is widowed, then a male kin can redeem her. And I put these in quotes so you'd understand the focus I'm trying to make here. A male kin can redeem her through marriage, assuring that through him, her inheritance will not be lost. And that would provide for her offspring, providing for her offspring. This practice, this is an important thought. This is important to remember. This practice was eventually abandoned because by the time we get to Jesus, we don't see leveret marriage. We don't see kinsman redemption as part of the plan when you get into the New Testament world. Somewhere along the way, the leveret marriage sort of dies out, which is evidence, as far as I'm concerned, that some of the familial 
um, personal codes of the Old Testament world were most accurately understood inside their context, their time and their place, not their permanence. And so there are things happening in the Old Testament code that as the boundaries of Israel expand, we have to expand our way of thinking in that. So for instance, the concept, although the practice of leveret marriage was abandoned, the concept was transferred. It was first transferred into Jesus, and then it was transferred into the church. And by church, I put the paraphrase of religion. Let me pause on the religion word for a minute, okay? I put it in parentheses because I want to focus on it for a second, but I don't want to yet. I want to start with Jesus. What I mean is that it was transferred in our theology. We don't have leveret marriage. We don't practice... Um, I don't know if I want to say we live in a more enlightened age, but we do live in an age where it's far better to be female than it would have been in the time of the Old Testament. That's for sure. Uh, and where you can have your own inheritance free of having your, the inheritance of your dad or free of having the inheritance of your husband or your brother. Because in many Old Testament circles, the daughter didn't get an inheritance, but the son did. And so the daughter had to get married off or she could be taken care of by her brother. And so we live in a world where those things don't apply. But the concept was always so that women were not abandoned. They were not left to themselves. They were not run over. They were not forgotten and they were not neglected. That's what leveret marriage was all about. Jesus comes along and what the early Christian thought did was they start to refer to Jesus as a redeemer. Jesus is a redeemer in a lot of ways. Sometimes he redeems you from the curse of the law. Sometimes he redeems us from sin and death. Sometimes he redeems us from the powers of darkness. Sometimes we need to see him as that redeemer. That the redeemer he is in that scenario is that he brings us into an inheritance. So let me go back to our Ephesians study for a second. This was months ago we did this, but if you go all the way back to Ephesians 1, look at two spots in the first chapter. Now these are only four verses apart, so for Paul, it's just a continuous flow. We break it up. We see seven, we see 11, we think there's a gap, but it's all one conversation. Put them together. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood. Redemption, redeemed. In Christ, we're redeemed through His blood, and that gives us forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So in verse seven, we could think that redemption is simply limited to forgiveness of sins. Christ has paid for me with His blood. But look at 11 with it. In Him also, we have an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. How did we get an inheritance in 11? Because in 7 we were redeemed. And in a Jewish mindset, to be redeemed is not simply to be bought out of something. It's to get an inheritance. If I had a kinsman redeemer, he marries me in. He brings me, I'm a poor widow, stranger, foreigner. He brings me in. By dropping the kinsman redemption concept into the book of Ruth, our author, whoever he or she may be, who I've told you is probably writing in the 5th century B.C., probably in the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah are enacting all of these religious laws and kicking Moabite women and their children out of Judah and sending them back to Moab because they don't belong. They don't belong with the people of God. Right in the middle of that environment, the book of Ruth introduces kinsman redemption. And who's being purchased? A Moabitess. Not just a widow. Not just a stranger. But the wrong kind of widow. And the wrong kind of stranger. And it should remind you of this moment in the ministry of Jesus. Love your neighbor. The way you love yourself. Yes. Um, who's my neighbor? And Jesus goes, good question. Let me tell you a story about a man who was, dry, who was traveling the road to Jericho and he gets beat up. And they steal all of his stuff. And he's lying by the side of the road and he's dying. And three people come by. One of them's a priest and one of them's a Levite and the other one is a Samaritan. And the, Levite, the priest turns the other way and the Levite crosses the road so he won't even touch him. But the Samaritan 
picks him up and pours in the oil and gives him wine, puts him on his donkey and takes him to a, the local inn and puts him up and decides to pay for everything. And Jesus said, who was the most neighborly? And everyone in the room there knows the answer. You knew the answer when the story got started. When you noticed the only guy that helped him, you knew who the neighbor was. The problem is, is that Jesus couldn't just tell a story about helping a dude. He had to make the dude that helped the people we really hate because that's his way, is to say it's, it'd be easy if it was your kin on the other side of the road. You'd go help them. It'd be easy if it was your next door neighbor. It'd be easy if it was, your, if it was some kid, that you, even if you'd never seen him before. But what if it's the opposite? What if it's a Moabite? Kinsman Redemption, by inserting this in the story, becomes the centerpiece of the story. It becomes... Would God's people receive a Moabitess if she came into the land? And would they consider her worthy of kinsman redemption? We're not forced to redeem her. She's a Moabite. You don't have to redeem her. She's on her own. That was stupid of... This is what we could say. That was stupid of her to move back. <laughs> she doesn't belong here. Well, I don't owe her anything. It's not like she's even under the law. It's not even like we're related. I'm not kin to her. Why would I bring her in? I hope you can see how this very much becomes the argument that Jesus makes in the Gospels. So Jesus redeems by blood and puts us into an inheritance. And as I said a moment ago, this tr gets transferred first into Jesus and then into the church. And if you'll remember, we parenthetically said religion. Now, let me pause and say this. Religion is not a dirty word, okay? Just because we are redeemed by God's grace doesn't mean that we don't have a religion. Um, I know I've said this before. I've said we don't have a religion, we have a relationship. Well... I think whenever I first came into that idea, I was so harmed by what had been called religion in me that I didn't think I could go forward if I had a religion. But I knew I could go forward in a relationship because a relationship is pliable. It is full of love and forgiveness. And religion to me was not pliable. No love, no forgiveness, just demands. Um, so in that sense, I needed to go from thinking of myself as a religious guy to thinking of myself in a relationship. But where I stand on that now is that Christianity, as we know it, is very much a religion. It's the pursuit of God. It's the pursuit of God in community. And religion can't be done alone, by the way. So part of the reason why the grace community embraces the this is a relationship, not a religion, part of it's PTSD. They've been hurt by religion. The other part is that there's a lot of us in the message of grace who have so individualized salvation as a righteousness experienced by faith that we've actually kind of pushed the edge of the church away so that we don't get hurt. And in that we go, well, we don't have a religion. We have a relationship. The truth is that religion, like any other thing in the world, can be toxic. There is such thing as toxic religion. Now I wish, when I wrote my book, Revelation and Transformation, 12 years ago, I wish I had not said, the law is religion, grace is relationship, you have a relationship, not a religion. I wish I had said, so many of us came out of religious environments that were toxic. It wasn't religion that was bad. It was the toxicity that had been placed into our religion that made us the center instead of Jesus. Now, I didn't say that, but I'm trying to say that now. And I'm trying to say to you that religion, as we know it, Christianity, the pursuit of God, has taken up the mantle of what used to be leveret marriage, of what we see in our Redeemer, who brings us into an inheritance, in that we pick up the responsibility within our religion. James says it this way in James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion. See, there's pure religion. If there's toxic religion, then there's pure religion. What would pure religion look like? Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. Visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble 
and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, in a lot of our evangelical churches, of which many of us came up in, we were really hot on the second half of that. Pure religion for us, keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's what we preached all the time. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Keep yourself unspotted. Don't sin. Don't do this. Don't watch this. Don't go there. Don't be a part of that. Which, once that became the entire message of our religion, it became toxic because we became the centerpiece of the message. And all we were doing was just trying to push the world out, gather ourselves in, and what happens in that environment is you Moabites don't belong because you're tainting this thing and this thing is not as pure as it could be because we've got people in here don't belong and they're not taking it serious and see how it's, we're not too many steps away from that. But if you'll notice, James doesn't put that first. He puts that last because for James, pure religion undefiled starts with this to take care of the orphans and the widows. Why orphans and widows? Because orphans don't have a dad and widows don't have a husband. And what happens in the Hebrew world if you don't have a dad and you don't have a husband? That's what we've been talking about. No inheritance, no one to take care of you, no future. Pure religion doesn't let anyone escape without a future. Pure religion, the pursuit of a God who loves us through Jesus, creates an environment where the widow and the orphan have a father and a husband. And it's not simply enough for us as the church to say, well, that's Jesus. Bring in the widows and the fatherless. Jesus will be your husband. Because what was my, sub my title tonight? When you are the answer. I hope you can see where I'm going with this. When you are the answer then it's no longer enough for you to just go, we'll just be praying for you. Welcome to church where Jesus will be your husband. Welcome to church where God will be your father. And then good luck, we'll be praying for you. No, part of our role, part of who we are is to take up what it means to care for those whom God has placed in our path. And so... Naomi says to Ruth, here's what I want you to do. I want you to clean up, put on your best dress. Now I'm being a little bit, I'm, in, I'm being a little anachronistic, all right? I don't know if she had all this stuff, but she does in my story. I want you to put on some makeup. I want you to get your best jewelry, good perfume, put on your best dress. And I want you to go to Boaz and I want you to offer yourself, this literally, I want you to offer yourself to Boaz. Now, we can take this to mean a bunch of stuff and we're adding, but we're also maybe not far off because it's pretty ambiguous what happens in the early verses of the third chapter where she goes, you go, she even says, go all the way to where, you, go find wherever he sleeps and go into his bedchamber and pull the covers back and lay down at the foot of his bed and offer him, if he wakes up, offer yourself to him. And well, what in the world does that mean? Well, we don't get to see inside of what everything means, but what we do get to see is the response that the story gives us of how Ruth and Boaz have this encounter. Watch, I'm skipping ahead on purpose. I told you weeks ago we weren't going to read every single verse of Ruth, but we are going to tell the whole story. Here's where we're going to pick it up. Ruth 3, 8. It happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself and there was a woman lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? So she answered, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing for you're a close relative. Hmm. Interesting statement by Ruth. Let's compare a couple of things. Remember this? I've had you holding this out there in your head. This whole message, Ruth 2.12, Boaz says to Ruth, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. And then in Ruth 3.9, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing for you're a close relative. And in Hebrew, she uses the same word on him that he used on her in Ruth 2. Your wing had to be a word, she's just learned Hebrew in the last few years. 
Maybe it's rudimentary. Maybe she's not good at it. Maybe it's kind of broken, her Hebrew. But she picked up on that word when he prayed it over her. Remember? When he prayed over her, may God put you under his wing. And she said, hmm, wing. I like that. And then when she gets a chance to introduce herself, it's the word she uses because she heard him use it. She brings it back to him. And she lays it in front of him, essentially. Maybe it's your wing. I mean, you asked God to put me under his wing. I'm asking you to put me under yours. The real question is, how serious were you about that prayer? Because you asked God to put me under a wing. I think I found the wing. <laughs> I, I think I've discovered the place that I'm supposed to be. Let's look at that word real quick, because this is beneficial. The word she uses is kanaf in the Hebrew. It's the word wing, but this is, this is cool to me. The Hebrews use this word for both wing and they use it for corner of a garment. So when you peel back the blanket to lay down at his feet, you've peeled back the kanaf, which is the same word in Hebrew for the wing. And a couple of moments in the life of Jesus stand out to me. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, how often did I want to gather you into myself as a hen gathers in her chicks, but you would not let me. Or as a hen puts her chicks under her wing. What's he mean when he says as a hen gathers her chicks? I want to, I want to put you underneath my wings. I wanted to hold you. I wanted to hug you. I wanted to pull you in, but you didn't want anything to do with me. And then there's another moment in Jesus' ministry where he's walking down the street and a woman with the issue of blood reaches through the crowd and grabs the hem of his garment or what I see as the corner of his garment. Jesus is the wing. For that woman, Jesus is the refuge. For Jerusalem, Jesus was the refuge. Jerusalem didn't want it. That woman did. Jerusalem misses out on the wing. That woman decides he's not getting past me. I'm not going to miss out on the wing, corner of his garment. Jesus is the refuge. Boaz learns then that he is the refuge because this was my thought. Be careful what you pray for. I know we've been over this because I have a very distinct feeling, a very distinct remembrance of standing right up here in this room saying something very similar to this, to this room. I don't know if it was a Tuesday. I don't know if it was a week, a monthly but something very similar to this thought. I didn't go back into my notes and do it word for word. I don't, want, I don't like to do that. I just wanted to see where I was today. My landing spot, be careful what you pray for because the answer will often begin with you. And don't ask for what you aren't willing to be a part of. Because when you pray, God, do this. It's you praying. So when God starts to do, you don't go visit me. You're the one that prayed it. He comes to you. That's what prayer is. He comes to you and he goes, okay, I'm glad to hear you ask that. What could we do? No, 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 Lord. I, I said you do it. He goes, hmm, see, that's not how this works. We're together. This is why we always keep our spiritual ear open. Don't ever let anybody poo-poo your spiritual ear. Okay, you live in a world of touch, taste, sight, sound, and smell, the five senses. And they laugh at the sixth, you know, and the sixth sense is not the ability to see dead people. <laughs> well, it was in a movie, but it's, but I mean, they laugh at the senses that you can't see. They go, well, that's not empirical. That's not evidential. You can't touch that. You can't, you can't trust it. You know what that other sense is? It's your heart, man. That's your soul. Some people call it your conscience. I call it the Spirit of God. He breathed into us and gave us the thing we cannot see. But you know it's very real, and it gets better the more you practice using it, right? So don't ever let anybody tell you that that's not as real as this and this and these and this and this because it is as every bit as real. And that's what prayer is. It's not just finally tuning the physical senses. They, have, they don't have near as much to do with it, though they can. But it's fine-tuning that heart. And as we enter prayer, we enter into a space in which we're asking the Lord to form us into who He would have us to be. 
And so there's no prayer in which God moves that he doesn't move first through you. No prayer you give in which God moves that he doesn't first move through you, that he doesn't form you, shape you, fashion you. The beautiful image of this is Boaz saying, God, I'm praying that God bless you, young lady, and put you under his wing. And then wakes up at midnight, wakes up in the midst of a deep sleep, and hears someone saying, okay, I'm here. I'm under the corner of the garment. Did you mean that prayer? Did you really mean you want, you want this for me? Read out from 10. He said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. And there it is. Because my daughter is the same word that Jesus uses when the woman with the issue of blood grabs hold of his garment and pulls her hand back. She grabbed hold of the wing. And Jesus comes and finds her. Who touched me? Oh, Lord, everybody's touching you. No, no, no. This was different. I felt something. Someone pulled up under my wing. <laughs> that, that's, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, somebody, somebody's asking for more. This, isn't, this wasn't an elbow in a crowd. This was big. Where is she? Where is he? And she comes forward. And Jesus says, daughter, you have whatever you're looking for. And he plays the Boaz role. Because if you're going to pull the covers off his feet and ask for his protection. If he's going to redeem you, he's going to bring you in as a member of the family. So Boaz, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. You've shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning in that you didn't go after young men, whether they were poor or rich. Boaz is probably not a young man. Um, I do think it's kind of funny that in a church culture of young women go find your Boaz, um, if you actually went and found your Boaz according to the text, He's probably older than your dad. He's your grandpa's age. Boaz, so if you want to go find that guy, well, he's, he might be out there. Um, and, but as I told you last week, the scripture doesn't support go find Boaz. It's Boaz goes and finds Ruth. Okay? You, all you do is go look for the protection of the Lord. And Boaz, Boaz is on the hunt for Ruth. He comes to the field and finds Ruth. He protects Ruth. He puts the sheaves on the ground. He has them drop handfuls on purpose. It's him that blesses Ruth in this moment. Ruth just offers herself. And in offering herself, she finds exactly what she's looking for. You didn't go out to young men, whether they were poor or rich. You, you just, you didn't, you didn't come hunting. So you accepted what I had to offer you. You didn't look for through a certain prism or through a certain thing. 11. Now, my daughter, don't fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people in my town know that you're a virtuous woman. So that's pretty cool. She hadn't been there long, but they've figured that out because you can live in a way that speaks of virtue. Now it is true that I'm a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Verse 13. Stay this night and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform that duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until the morning. We'll stop here because this is the moment where we get introduced to the fact that Boaz is actually not the one. He's not the closest relative. There's someone else. This is going to set up a scenario by which we find out how redemption occurs. Um, don't overthink it, okay? Because our, our tendency is to squeeze. We Christians like to squeeze these Old Testament stories and get every drip out of gospel or New Testament. And sometimes the story is being told through a different prism and lens than we can understand. I think there's a little bit of that in this kinsman. So we'll get into him next week. And there's, some, there's sort of some setup that I think is beautiful as we get into an, the idea of kinsman redemption. My, my, my spot for you to take away tonight, there's all kinds of good stuff in here. I love this wing stuff. I love the corner of the garment stuff. I love the daughter stuff. But let the title be where you land tonight. Sometimes you're the answer. You've been praying something. And the Lord is beginning to show you that he's, he's equipped you to be in some ways exactly what it is that you're looking for. Sometimes we keep waiting on something to come from the outside. We keep waiting on an answer to come from another person or an answer to come from there. And, and quite possibly it's something needs to shift in us, change, break in us. It puts us in the place where we are the answer.
Let's pray. And I want to pray for you watching. Those of you who are following along in this journey, I got a response today from someone who said, thank you. They said, I don't know who else you're doing this for, but you're doing this study for me. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Father, you're good. I don't know who I'm doing this for either. <laughs> I, I, I do know that it's been for me. Uh, I do know that there's been beautiful th times in every one of these five lessons that I saw something fresh or new that I hadn't seen before. And every time it has softened my heart about you and your love. And tonight was no exception. Thank you for that. I've been praying about a lot of stuff, Father. Um, I'm beginning to see it, that in a few of them, the answer is not very far away. It's just a mind shift away. Sometimes it's a repentance away. Sometimes you've already given me the ability to do what I'm asking you to do. I just, it's been dormant or I haven't stepped into it. So show me where I am a participant as you do the same in every one of those watching and listening. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.